Chapter 2 of Our Little Canadian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean McGahey. Our Little Canadian Cousin by Elizabeth Roberts MacDonald. Chapter 2. It was a tired and homesick little girl that Mr. Merrithew helped out of the coach and led up the steps of his house about a fortnight after our story opens. The journey from Montreal had been long and lonely, the parting from her parents hard, and the thought of meeting the unknown relatives had weighed upon her mind and helped to make her unusually subdued. But when the door of the big brick house, which had been named by the neighbors when it was the only brick house on the street and the largest one in town, opened, and her aunt's motherly arms closed around her, while Marjorie's rosy laughing face and Jackie's fair cherubic one beamed on her in greeting, her spirits began to revive. The greeting was so warm and kind, and the joy at her coming so genuine, that her fatigue seemed turned, as by magic, to a pleasant restfulness, and her homesickness was lost in this bright home atmosphere. Mrs. Merrithew took the little newcomer to her room, had her trunk settled conveniently, and then left her to prepare for the late tea which was waiting for them all. When Dora was ready, she sat down in the little armchair that stood near a table piled with books and looked about her contentedly. There was an air of solid comfort and coziness about this house that rested her. This room which her aunt had told her was just opposite Marjorie's, was all furnished in the softest shades of brown and blue, her favorite colors. The carpet was brown, with a very small spray of blue here and there. The wallpaper was lighter, almost creamy, brown with a dainty harebell pattern, and the curtains had a rich brown background with various Persian stripes in which the blue and cream and gold predominated. The bed, to her great delight, had a top piece and a canopy of blue-flowered chintz, and the little dressing table was draped to match it. Just over the side of the bed was a bookshelf, quite empty, waiting for her favorite books. While she sat and looked about in admiration, the door was pushed gently open, and a plump Maltese kitten came in, gazed at her doubtfully a moment, and then climbed on her lap. Then Marjorie's bright face appeared at the door, and... "'May I come in?' she asked. "'Oh, please do,' Dora cried. "'Kitty has made friends with me already, and I think that must be a good omen.' Marjorie laughed as she patted the little bunch of blue-gray fur in Dora's lap. "'Jackie has made friends with you already,' she said and I think that is a better omen still. He told Mother he thought you were the beautifulest girl he ever saw. Dora's eyes opened wide with astonishment. It is the first time I was ever called beautiful, she said, let alone beautifulest. What a dear boy Jack must be. Then they both laughed, and Marjorie obeying one of her sudden impulses, threw her arms around Dora's neck and gave her a cousinly hug. "'You and I will be friends, too,' she said. "'I knew it as soon as I looked at you.'" Dora's dark brown eyes looked gravely into Marjorie's blue ones. She seemed to be taking the proposition very seriously. "'I have always wished for a real friend or a twin sister,' she said thoughtfully. The twin sister is an impossibility, and I have never before seen a girl that I wanted for a great, great friend. But you, ah yes, you are like my father, and besides, we are cousins, and that makes us understand each other. Let us be friends. She held out her hand with a little gesture which reminded Marjorie that this pale, dark-haired cousin was the descendant of many French grand dames. She clasped the slender hand with her own plump fingers and shook it heartily. So, in girlish romance and sudden resolution, the little maid sealed a compact which was never broken, 
and began a friendship which lasted and grew in beauty and strength all through their lives. At the breakfast table the next morning there was a merry discussion as to what should be done first to amuse Dora. Jackie, who had invited her to sit beside him and beamed at her approvingly over his porridge and cream, suggested a walk to his favorite candy store and the purchase of some sticks of pure chocolate. Marjorie proposed a picnic at Old Government House. This was approved of, but postponed for a day or two to allow for preparations and invitations. Mr. Merrithew said, Let us go shooting bears. But even Jackie did not second this astounding proposition. As usual, it was Mother who offered the most feasible plan. Suppose this morning, she said, you just help Dora unpack and make her thoroughly at home in the house and garden. Then this afternoon, perhaps, your father will take you for a walk and show Dora the house where Mrs. Ewing lived and any other interesting places. That would do for today, wouldn't it? Then day after tomorrow we could have the picnic, and for the next week I have a magnificent idea, but I want to talk it over with your father. And she nodded and smiled at that gentleman in a way which made him almost as curious as the children. That's the way with mother, Marjorie said to Dora after breakfast. She never ends things up. There is always another lovely plan just ahead, no matter how many you know about already. And Mr. Merrithew, who overheard the remark, thought that perhaps this was part of the secret of his wife's unfailing usefulness both in looks and spirits. The walk that afternoon was one which Dora always remembered. Mr. Merrithew had, as Jackie said, the splendidest way of splainin' things, and found something of interest to relate about almost every street of the little city. They went through the beautiful cathedral, and he told them how it had been built through the earnest efforts of the well-known and venerated Bishop Medley, who was afterward Metropolitan of Canada. Then they wandered down the street along the river and saw the double house where Mrs. Ewing, whose stories are loved as much in the United States and Canada as they are in England, lived for a time, and where she wrote. She had called this house Rica Dom, which means river house, and had written in many of her letters of the beautiful river on which it looked, and the gnarled old willows on the bank just in front of her windows. These willows she had often sketched, and Dora carried away a spray of the pale gray-green leaves in memory of her favorite story writer. It was one of Dora's ambitions, kept secret hitherto, but now confided to Marjorie, to write stories something like Mrs. Ewing's. They saw, too, the picturesque cottage in which a certain quaint old lady had attained to the ripe age of a hundred and six years, a record of which Fredericton was justly proud. This venerable dame had been addicted to the unlimited eating of apples, and her motto, she was not a grammatical old lady, had been, according to tradition, apples never hurts nobody. They spent some time in the legislative library, where was enshrined a treasure in the shape of a magnificent copy of Audubon's Book of Birds. Then, in the departmental buildings nearby, there was a small but well-arranged museum of stuffed birds and beasts, all Canadian, and most of them from New Brunswick. There were other things, too, to see, and many anecdotes to hear, so that it was a somewhat tired, though happy and hungry party which trudged home just in time for tea. And such a tea, suited to hearty outdoor appetites born of the good Canadian air. There were fresh eggs made into a white and golden omelette by Mrs. Merrithew's own hands, for even Debbie, who had cooked for the family all their lives, owned that an omelette like Mrs. Merrithew's she could not manage. No, sir, not if I was to cook day and night. There was golden honey in the comb. There was johnny cake, hot and yellow and melting in your mouth, strawberry jam that tasted almost as good as the fresh fruit itself, 
ginger cake, dark and rich and spicy, milk that was almost cream for the children, and steaming, fragrant coffee for their elders. It is rather nice to get good and hungry, Jackie gravely observed. That is, if you have plenty in the house to eat. I think life would be very dull without meals. These philosophical remarks rather astonished Dora, who was not yet accustomed to the contrast between Jack's sage reflections and his tender years. Just now they seemed especially funny, because he was almost falling asleep while he talked. When Mrs. Mary Sue saw him nodding, she rang, and the nurse, who, like Debbie, was a family institution, came in and carried him off in her stalwart arms to his little white bed. When his mother stole up a little later to give him a final good-night kiss, she heard Susan singing and paused at the door to listen. Now the day is over, was ended, and then a drowsy voice murmured, Now, Susan, my very favorite song! And then Susan sang in her soft, crooning voice, The maple leaf, the maple leaf, the maple leaf forever. End of chapter 2 Recording by Sean McGahey DuctTapeGuy.net